I'm looking forward to bringing this album, Triple Tray, to the masses in its true form and finding a way to do big band shows around the world because that's a tall order and we are determined to, to bring this to the people. You know, we, we did a show, like an album release show last Friday in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the energy in the room was just so amazing. And that's why I love putting on these shows in the first place to kind of, so to kind of mix it in with the Butcher Brown universe is really special and exciting for me. That's awesome. It's, it's gonna also going to be fun exciting. to prove some people wrong too. <laughs> some people that are like, do this. Some people said we. Could, some people said it couldn't be done. We're going to do it. That's right. We'll see. We'll see. Gonna prove them wrong. Exactly. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Inner Sleeve Music Podcast on Watch Mojo, the podcast taking a behind the scenes look at all things music. I'm Cassius Morris. Joe Pacheco joining me on the line as per usual. What's going on, Joe? Gearing up for winter, bro. Gearing up for winter. Uh, don't remind me. I'm getting ready to hibernate <laughs> I thinking, already. I know. And it's not like I wish, sort of, not wish, but I wish like this, the winter was sort of like in Game of Thrones, you know, where the winter right. is like, it takes years to come, you know? No, no, this one's coming. And it's just fast. pretty and not as cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Except we don't have people trying to come and kill us, but yeah. That, that's a good uh, consolation, 100%. <laughs> We have a fun pack show for you guys today. Our special guests are going to be none other than the guys from Butcher Brown joining us on today's episode of the podcast. A fun packed episode with a lot of people in a lot of different locations, Joe. I feel like we we had a, a little slice of like each uh, city here in the States. Yeah, no, it was interesting. Like uh, somewhere off on the road, somewhere at home, somewhere in the studio. And one was getting his hair done, which was that's right. That's the first for me, man. That's a first for me having someone do their hair while you're in an interview. And it was a little <laughs> bit like you know, because the way Zoom works, it's like someone drops out to go do something. They come back in the interview, and then it's like, oh, everything changes. So it was a bit of a an exercise to get everything to fit nice and tight. But like. Um, yeah, no, great band, great musicians. I'm pretty sure you guys are going to really like it. Like, it's a lot of Afro jazz, fusion, R&B, hip-hop, rap. It's like almost everything, you know? A lot of different uh, stuff. It's a melting pot of music for sure, and we definitely think you guys are going to enjoy it. Hopping into some news in the world of music, the masterminds themselves, Pink Floyd, are back again with another remix or what people are calling a rebirth of one of their classic albums, of course, Animals. Now, this remix doesn't only just come in audio form, but we were actually also blessed with an 11 and a half minute documentary about the album process behind Animals, which I don't know about you, Joe, but for me personally, this might have to be my favorite Floyd album. I mean, this and Wish You Were Here is basically the tie for me. We're both the same. We're exactly the same. It's tied. And it's funny because like you feel like you're, you know, like, what about Dark Side? What about The Wall? Right. What about whatever? There's so many great albums. Metal, right? This is a great album. Yeah. And I'm only like, you know, like I, I consider myself a huge, like a huge fan, a big Pink Floyd fan, one of my all-time favorite bands. But for some reason, I'm unable to go past a certain like in the beginning beginning the sit barrett yeah it's just too crazy weird for me and i could never really get into it a saucer full of secrets i got into you know listening to it but like as soon as i don't know metal and onward uh it just like that's the pink floyd that i grew up with as a young kid you know so i was more into this era but then i discovered Al animals in the 90s you know like just i bought it bought the cd it's like i don't have this album from uh, pink floyd and i bought it and I listened to it so much. It stayed in my car for so long that like it, just, it literally became my favorite album, I think. And then it's hard to, like you, stuck between this one and they're just so good, but so different, you know, in terms that's of That's the thing. They all yeah. have their own worlds and their own aesthetics too. I mean, that's the thing about Pink Floyd. Like with every album they did, they had, you know, and, and like we see here, you know, with the album cover, just the, the different yeah. aesthetics, the inflatables. I mean, I think what this documentary especially emphasizes is, the creative vision of these guys, because, you know, we're so used to seeing these visuals now, but we have to remember it, it had to come from somewhere. And these guys were the pioneers in 90% of these practical effects. Yeah. And like, you know, many bands didn't have the budget to kind of do these type of things, but I don't even know, you know, budget aside, it's the creativity, the craziness, the like never been done before aspect of these certain things, you know, like. You think of it, it's like now you look at it, a picture, it's just like, okay, it's Battersea, as you see here, they're building here the power station, right? And then they flew a pig around it. But this, if you read, I've read the book a few times and like so many stories of how many times they tried to capture the picture. And I'd be like so frustrated if I was like 
uh, the photographer that all this is happening, a giant sized <laughs> pig, and then you just miss the shot or, you know, exactly. You get, and, and this is not like the Nikons of the zooms today where I have, where I can cheat and take like six shots per second da, 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 as spray and pray as they call it, you know, whereas this, you really had to know your uh, aperture, your focus. Are you locked in? Is it like, you know, before you couldn't see this at the back of the screen. So no, we got to do it again. You know, like, you and you also couldn't really Photoshop good. back then. I mean, for me, like seeing this photo, the, the most interesting thing that I found out in the documentary was that this photo was actually real. To be honest, I completely thought this was just transposed. And I guess you could have maybe done it back then in, in a different way. But it's like nowadays, this would have just been a Photoshop pig, right? Yeah, that's it. Oh, for sure. You know, and like, <laughs> and it's funny because like in the documentary, you'll see uh, the, 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 somebody says, oh, I found a pig in my back, in my farm, in my field, you know, right. Like, enormous <laughs> See, you're scaring oh, yeah. my, my sheep. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So we'll go and, uh, you know, recover it. But yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to see how these guys like really look, you know, like they really, it, it's a, a huge budget, you know, and, you know, I don't know, man, like today, I don't know, like so much easier today than that back then, you know, they had to do all these, um, you know, extravagant things, or they wanted to do these extravagant things. And look, we're still talking about it, what, 40, 50 years later. So, you know, it's, it's insane. Still, uh, impressive, you know. Uh, the documentary, what did you think about it? I watched it like live as it was premiering, and I was like, what? It's it? It's over? I was uh, hoping for yeah, like an hour, I thought it'd be hour longer, and a half. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was a bit disappointed in that, but maybe there's more to come. Uh, and like my favorite part of the documentary is like, I'll skip back here. Uh, you'll see like, there, I just, Turn it on and I see like one of my favorite guitar players, David Gilmore, and he's playing in a Montreal Canadiens jersey, which I never oh, knew was even beautiful. a thing. You know, like I didn't even know he ever wore that. There you go. You know, you have there he is. <laughs> then it made me think, well, maybe this is in, in 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 here in Montreal back in the 70s. I remember there was a show and that's the show that somebody pissed off Roger Waters. I don't know what the, the angle was anymore. And he spit on that person on the crowd or something oh, wow. like that. And that's where the wall concept came. I think it was from this show in Montreal, you know, no kidding. Hey, yeah. yeah, See, yeah. That's insane so, to actually think about. And you know what, what's weird for me too, Joe is actually seeing these guys sort of in their prime. Like the one thing about pink Floyd is there's so little footage. Like this may be the most footage we've ever seen from yeah. animals. And when it comes to the tour, I know they didn't actually call it the animals tour, but you know, this was when they were touring it. And I mean, you know, it's just, it's weird to see because they were so enigmatic. You didn't, you know, you always saw their artwork. You never saw the guys. Yeah, that's it. You know, and I, I growing up, I got into them. It was the, uh, the live album. I mean, I'd heard of it as a kid growing up. I mean, you couldn't be anywhere without hearing uh, Hey kid, you know, uh, teacher, right. leave those kids alone. Right. When I was a kid, but when I heard um, Delicate Sound of Thunder, which was a live version of a uh, recording of the tour, which was after The Wall, I believe. Anyway, so um, I listened to that album, and that's what really got me into Pink Floyd. So that's why I'm stuck on the later on of Pink Floyd. Yeah. And already Rogers wasn't there. So for me, nothing is really missing. But obviously there is because, I mean, he's on all the other albums and he's incredible, <laughs> you know. But no I mean, doubt. Wasn't, wasn't missing for me, you know, like that, that he wasn't there. They had already gone to the next era of Pink Floyd, you know. Absolutely iconic. I definitely tend to side with that stuff too. Like even the stuff, you know, by Gilmore later in their career, like a, a momentary lapse in reason, uh, you know, all, all awesome stuff, good instrumentals. So, you know, it's yeah, great to see the icons. Yeah. I saw the division bell tour myself in 94 oh. here at the big O and, um, that was like, and I still love that. I don't know if people like that. album. I don't know what, if that album is considered a pink, you know, it is considered a pink Floyd. It's a pretty album, good like, album. I love, I liked it. You know, it was like, for me, it was a great album for, for them. Uh, and I still listen to it today. You know, there's something about that song. Keep talking marooned. There's like, yeah. uh, it's, it's a very uh, Gilmore album. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of Pink Floyd fans in Montreal, which I'm sure there's plenty of them tuned into this episode today, you are not going to want to miss this brand new announcement coming to Montreal. Now, we've just found out that the Pink Floyd exhibition, their mortal remains is going to be featured on November 4th, right here in the city. Yeah, no, I was like, this came across my feet and I sort of almost missed it, you know, and I was like, yeah, what my Pink Floyd, I thought it was like another tribute band or something like that, you know, and then I saw the documentary and then I was like, oh, wait a minute. And then I went back to this and I'm like, oh, it's an exhibition from Pink Floyd, you know, like start in Montreal, November 4th. And what's really cool is like, I don't know, I, to be honest, I don't know what to expect, but it's, it's like the first time it's in Canada. Um, so that's, that's cool, you know, uh, and 
Yeah, here it is. Like the Canadian is the band visited the Canadian city for the very first time in November 1971 for a sold out show at Sepsum, which was a, a smaller area. But they also were the first. Um, here you go, like the Montreal Forum, the Autostad, uh, and many, many sold out nights at the Olympic Stadium. So they go to the first, the first ever concert at the Olympic Stadium. Wow. Like 70, 70 million, the, sorry, 70,000 <laughs> people. I think it's still the most attended concert ever in that venue, you know? That's insane. Uh, so it's Pink pretty- Floyd, lo- showing love to Montreal. Well, definitely. So can we catch you with this exhibit, Joe? Because I mean, you know, if I was there, I'd be going. I'm definitely going to go. I'm not exactly nice. sure when. And the tickets are reasonably priced. They're like, uh, from what we've seen, like if we go here, um, you know, Tuesday, Wednesdays are 27 plus taxes. Thursday, Friday is 36 Canadian dollars plus taxes. Five-year-olds are free. Saturday and Sunday is $45.23 taxes. So it's a pretty decent price, you know, and uh, I'm pretty sure like, you know, I don't know how long it would take to to see the whole thing. You know, uh, is it an hour long or is it two hours long? The longer the better, if you ask me. And I'd, I'd definitely like to see a lot of this stuff and hopefully some authentic stuff from their past. I'm sure there's tons of authentic things they, they either use for covers or props. Yeah, here, 300 plus artifacts, objects are on display. Um, bands Extraordinary Career, uh, you will get, sorry, I'm reading as in real time, you will get to see the first hand objects such as handwritten lyrics, musical instruments, wow. letters, stage props, and original artworks, to name a few. And as you see, it's really, you know, there's some cool stuff. Shut up and take my record. money. Yeah, seriously, right? <laughs> so I'm definitely going to go check this out. And hopefully, I don't know if they'll allow us to take pictures or whatever or video, but like hopefully I'll be able to get something for the podcast as well. And, Beautiful. Uh, definitely looking forward to that. Uh, this looks cool. This looks really cool with the light bulbs. Anyway. I'm tripping out already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excited. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping over to the Sound Mojo community tab, of course, right on our YouTube page. We highly recommend you go subscribe. This first entry, we actually asked you guys a question with a very colorful image. And I'm, I'm more so distracted by this picture here, Joe, because this is like yeah. a, a plethora for, for, uh, for the rock fans here. Yeah, this is uh, so basically we asked how, if you could own any piece of uh, music memorabilia, what would it be? And I've never really given this any, I'm not a collector, of, so I've never really given this ser- any serious thought, but I saw mm. the picture and I'm like, oh, I got to ask the audience. And uh, we got some interesting uh, comments, you know? So what the heck, man, 300 uh, responded, uh, Lars Ulrich's drum kit used during Justice and Black Album Tours. Oh, wow. That's That'd be cool. a cool artifact. For me, I, I think it would have to be a, a drum kit also, but from John Bonham. That's going to be my answer. <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. Edit that out. Yeah, John Bonham for sure. Uh, definitely would love to play on his kit. Um, we have here Jimmy Jimmy Hendrix guitar. Uh, who Frank Point Dexter? Definitely any Hendrix guitar. So iconic, man. Well, would you like it <laughs> the guitar or would you like it the burned one after he burned it? Dude, you know, honestly, that- I think the burned one would be kind of original because anybody can get it. Like a, <laughs> well, not anybody, I guess, but you know, it'd probably <laughs> easier to come by a Strat by Hendrix. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Or a Fender. You know, like old Fender, uh, like Fender, uh, Hendrix Fender headstocks where like they're like fat at the top because then um, they, they they made them smaller in the 80s or the 70s, 80s. But I love those big fat heads. The classics. Uh, Rene, Rene Catania's, uh anything from Marvin Gaye. That's something I, w- I okay. never thought of. Yeah, a microphone yeah. or, or you, you never know. Maybe something at the Hard Rock Cafe. You could. Uh... Yeah. Liz Donovan, Liz Donovan, a pair of Prince's boots. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. <laughs> That'd be interesting. That's definitely a conversation piece, you know, like if you have some funky boots in the middle of nowhere, like, wait, what's, whose boots are these, you know? Seriously. Uh, yeah, Can you spot any of the guitars in here? Because, I mean, there's so many iconic pieces. Yeah, like, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what I have in my throat today, but <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Like right off the bat, I can spot hidden here, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd's Black oh. and White Strat. Um, I'm assuming this Reckenbacher, maybe something the Beatles ish. I'm not sure. Bottom right looks like Hendrix, right? The, the white guitar this guy here, the white one the white? there. Yeah, it could be. I mean, that's could be. Very generic. This might be something with Hendrix. I'm not sure 100. percent This obviously is uh, Zach Wild. Um, oh yes, Les Paul kind of thing. I'm I think looking. the actually the, the American one is that him too, or was that a uh, Springsteen? Not sure. That I'm not okay. Sure. I think that might have been Zach make- too. This, I would assume, now that I see it for a second time, uh, is Jimmy Page's uh, 6 yes. and 12 string uh, uh, guitar, Gibson. Uh, this one here, 
this you really got to be a guitar player to understand this one. This is George Lynch from Doc in the 80s. Oh. And at the time they did, he had this guitar, which is called the Mr. Scary guitar. And uh, and you may have heard them on uh, Freddy Krueger's Dream Warriors. That was the song, it was Doc in Dream Warriors. And that's oh, one no of my kidding. favorite guitar players too growing up. He just has such a unique vibe and sound. This one we speculated on maybe being who. And I'm pretty sure it is. It was either Cheap Trick or Vi, right? I, I think it's Steve Vi because I remember seeing that tape. It's like a yellow tape okay, or something yeah. right in here. Near the bottom. And all the gold hardware. So I'm, I'm thinking this is a Steve Vi uh, gem or universe, three, three neck universe. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else. I would assume that? maybe Bob Marley in the bottom left or sorry, the top left. They're here. Yeah, maybe that's a PRS. Or, or like- definitely it would have to be a reggae artist just based on the colors. Yeah, this looks Van Halen-ish over here. Oh, yeah. Eddie Van Halen. What, what a piece to leave out of the photo. Yeah, well, you know, there's only so much you can fit into this That's photo, true. I guess, right? You know, I've been stuck there where it's like you have, want to take this whole scene, but your lens only lets you take this much. That's but yeah, fact. this is uh, definitely something I, I never thought. What would I own? I would love to yeah, have Yeah, what would Gilmore. you own? I would love to have Gilmore Strat, but I mean, like, yeah. I mean, I'll take anything. I'll take any guitar. I don't know. I, I'm not really that picky, but uh, I never really stopped to think about like something like, wow, I would love to have that. I've just always just enjoyed the uh, hearing uh, it. Yeah. Hearing it and just people's instruments. Like I love like the, the George Lynch had so many guitars when I was growing up. So it's like so many different ESP models. I definitely take one of those kamikazes of his for sure. And he had the, these kamikaze model. Uh, you? You I still the, have to say John Bonham, John honestly, Bonham, yeah. just to get my hands on a, a piece of his drums. Cause I've always been curious about, if his drums were physically composed differently than anyone else's or if he was that sound, yeah. you know, I'd you love know, to I see could that. Answer that. I would venture, I guess, as saying, I don't think they're different than anybody else's. I just think the the beast playing them was completely yeah. different from everybody else. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and the yeah. fact that they recorded too, in like these big English houses, like with all this echo, uh, well, you know, the drum sound just ridiculous. Well, yeah, that's the one that Levy breaks drum sound. And yeah. that's like a legendary, you know, that sample, I wonder how many times it's been sampled because they're always saying that the, the James Brown breakbeat is the most sampled drum of all time uh, loop. But I think, man, uh, Bonham would have to come pretty damn close because every, Beastie Boys, everybody used that big beat. And the story behind that, that was recorded apparently at uh, Aleister Crowley's mansion that they bought. Uh, really? Jimmy owned at the time and like in at the bottom of a stairwell and the mics all the way up the top or high up and then yeah, that's how you got that big beefy sound so that crazy. everybody to this day is still chasing <laughs> it's still wow it's still something you know that's like so iconic that drum sound it's insane here we ask you guys on what instrument did you start playing music and do you still play that instrument good question and, and joe i, I want to ask you the same thing but i think i know the answer for you um it's well i started playing on guitar i would believe that would be the first one and i'm still playing guitar um but very close to guitar was clarinet i started playing clarinet as well uh and then i moved on from clarinet to french horn but the guitar has always been my love and still is Uh, i don't play it every day anymore i just played for fun i played for recording when i'm writing on my own stuff but like in general it wasn't that when i was a kid that eight hours a day i had to play i would get home from my school i would play until midnight you know from four wow. to midnight i'd be playing you know that's insane um, yeah so let's see what so what about you <clears throat> for me personally i've always been a drummer um i can you know i'm definitely not a professional uh you know by any standard but i i would say i was at the pretty mid intermediate level for sure but then when i started apartment living that sort of brought that to an end but uh, i recently rented an electronic kit for a while and i had a lot of fun i gotta say but yeah i i started on drums and i still play that you know here on again and off again today honestly for me it was i always wanted to be a drummer i always loved the drums but i was young seven eight years old living in an apartment forget it there was no drums and my brother just showed up with an acoustic guitar out of nowhere and I'm like, what's this? Where'd you get this? And he's like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm getting lessons here, blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, you showed me right away how to play uh, Satisfaction from uh, nice. Stones. And like, I was hooked, you know. And then I actually learned that on guitar as well. Cause I, like, I have yeah. learned like some, the basic rudiments of, of guitar. And uh, definitely drums come more natural to me. Let's just say that. But Satisfaction, I actually learned as well. Yeah. So let's see what some of our uh, <clears throat> audiences into uh, or, or played. So Tara. Tara Barra. Um, I started playing the flute in the sixth grade and played all the way through to high school. I only played a handful of times over the years, but the last time I picked it up was seven or so years ago. It's funny because the flute, 
my daughter was playing it for a while and she did really well at it. <clears throat> and then her too, sort of, you know, if you don't keep that interest, it just sort of like fades. Uh, not Donald Fagan. Piano as a kid, but never got into it. A lot of kids. That seems to be the story with a lot of kids being either a common forced, one. forced to take piano or violin lessons and not enjoying it. Um, great pace for understanding music, though. Trumpet in high school was pretty good. Always found it easy. I could probably pick that up again and still play a bit for sure. I think once you've, you know, once you've played enough, you won't forget how to sort of play. You just got to get like back into shape of playing it. It's like anything, right? Yep. Double a bit in drums, occasional play to church. One thing about percussion is you can tap a beat on anything pretty much. I mean, we've all done it on our desks. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in school and all that stuff while listening to music. Um, so Michelle Farrell, I used to play the French horn Hey, uh, when I was in junior high, but once I went to high school and my music teacher wanted to take lessons, me to take lessons over summer, but I couldn't afford to. So I gave it up. That sucks. Aww, that's sad. They should have helped her out with those lessons. See, like I never had lessons. My parents didn't have the money for lessons. So I was, I, and I, I didn't even own a guitar. I would, when my brother would leave, I would sneak in and play his guitar, take it out of his case, <laughs> play with the radio and try to learn something and then put it away. And before he got home, in trouble. <laughs> except that one time I broke a string and I didn't know how to fix the string. Damn. So I got, got caught. Put it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got caught. Uh, it was like that when I found it. Exactly. Yeah. Michael E. Fillion, guitar. And yes, still enjoy playing. Game X Simmons. I started with violin, but I stopped playing after a year. That was when I was like 10. And then Linda Shipley, clarinet, alto sax, bass clarinet at at 11, age 11, middle school onwards. A bass okay. clarinet. Have you ever seen that? The bass no. clarinet? No. What is that? That is so freaky, the bass clarinet. A let's bass see clarinet. Can, uh, yeah. Let's see if I can uh, search something up here. Pull that up, Jamie. Bass clarinet. It's interesting because I've never seen one. Look how long this thing is. You know, Whoa. It, you almost got to play are huge. it. Like, yeah. Whereas normally the clarinet is like, you know, straightforward. You play it like a soprano kind of sax. Right. When you're playing, it's like this thing is wow. loud. Okay. It looks a lot, a lot more, bigger in that picture. Yeah, that's it. You know, so I didn't, uh, I hated the clarinet when I was learning it and playing it. I didn't like it. Um, but a few years later, hearing solo clarinet, like in a jazz context, whatever, I learned to appreciate the tone of it and, and what you can do mm. with the clarinet. But when I was playing it, it was like folklore kind of Portuguese stuff. So it's like, you know, you're very limited. I wasn't playing, uh, you know, um, Beethoven or those type of things. Mozart I was learning more a restricted catalog of music, you know. But I really appreciate cool. like where I was sitting because I got to learn that oh first violin like you know, not violin first clarinet second I got to hear the different parts and how they harmonized and how instruments spoken in the orchestra two of themselves so that's where I got the biggest benefit that served me later on in rock metal and even music production where everything sort of has a space you know that's very cool wow definitely some classic you know instruments can teach you a lot about even maybe the the, the less you know traditional ones yeah for sure. Here we ask Michael Jackson versus Prince, which I think is a, that's not even fair, Joe. Like, come yeah, on. <laughs> no, that's why we did it. That's why we that's did why it. We did it. What do you get, say on this one? I mean, if you know. you get that feeling inside, we're like, oh, it's not fair. No, no, I'm doing it, you know, like, because. Exactly. Tough. But look, Michael Jackson got 79% of 185 votes. He got 79%. Prince got 21. Now that obviously wow. it's a question of taste and popularity, but I mean. Let's see what the comments say. So Spartaco 52, Prince is the most complete artist of all times. Hard to argue with that. Um, He's definitely up there. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, Leeler, Michael is a, is kind and nice, sweet, and has cool dance moves and a beautiful voice. Ain't going to argue there. Can't argue with that. Linda Shipley, love Prince, but I grew up with Michael, saw the magic in his style, songs, and gift of performance. What a dancer father uh he is the king of pop uh okay. dance song writing love cool nice words for the king of pop i yeah. mean i definitely think prince is maybe less it's hard to say less mainstream because he's one of the biggest artists in the world but like compared yeah. to michael jackson i think he has less mainstream think, listenability his stuff was a little bit more risque yeah i think if you yeah anybody next to michael jackson would probably like you know uh Suffer the same fate, I guess, if you want to say something yeah. like that. Uh, Lorenzo Pignanoli. Let's see. The co the confront is possible. I'm not sure if I'm reading that right, but the winner 
is no contest Michael Jackson. Okay, okay. History remembers his majestic charisma and talent. Prince had good numbers too, for sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Flower Girl Power 67. Prince is a rock star. The instruments he the instrument he played, the songs, those eyes, he never molested a child. Oh. He was born in 67, so I grew up with the Jacksons. Nothing compares to Prince. Uh, and then we have Veggie Aussie, Aussie, Aussie Chick. Sorry. Uh, Michael Michael Jackson has more upbeat songs. So That's probably true. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the thing, I don't know. Who would you pick in this? Who I have to go with Michael, but again, you put anybody next to Michael for me, and I'm going to pick them. And the thing is, too, you put next to anybody next to Prince, and I'm going to pick Prince. So I think in this situation, I have to pick Michael, though. What about you? That's a tough call in this one, man. Like, uh, I think for me, it would be a lot more 50-50 in the sense that, like, I grew up with both of them. Both were massive stars when I was growing up. Songs everywhere. Uh, man, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm stuck. It's really hard. I like, I mean, like I've watched Michael when he was even younger with the Jacksons and I was like, what was this kid doing? You know, but yeah. then you know, that Prince plays every instrument. He did all that stuff, all the tracking, the writing. I don't know, man. I would he did movies edge, just like Michael too. You know, I would. Yeah, exactly. I would edge it over to Prince for myself. Okay. Just Solid response. Because of the extra instrumentation, maybe, you know, or something, you know. The, the thing with me is I would rather be Prince than Michael. Like, if they said, who could you switch bodies with for a day, I would say Prince. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because the fact that, like, as popular as he was, uh, I'm not saying that Michael was guilty of chasing the fame or, like, looking for spotlight or, or like, you know, media attention. But, like, he really... Prince was able to somehow stay out of it a lot and just focus on the music and what was important. And all the while fighting to get his masters back and to own his catalog and all that. So, yeah, but I mean, this is a tough one, but like I would give 51, I would give for me for Prince. Okay. If you guys missed this one, make sure to let us know in the comments what you think. Michael Jackson or Prince, let us know right here on this episode. Hopping into some listener suggestions. This, of course, is the part of the show where we take you guys' suggestions from the Sound Mojo comms tab of songs for us to listen to, and we react on the show. And this week we had a very eclectic sort of bunch, Joe. This was, uh, I think, quite different from other weeks. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's, but they're always different every week. This is different, different. <laughs> this yeah, week. this was like different, you know, exceptional, even for our, our audience. Uh, we're going to kick it off with Xylent. Am I saying silent or Xylent? I would say Xylent, but Xylent. Uh, we are dust. Idea. And we actually listened to the album uh trailer. So we listened to like a mashup of a bunch of this, the songs from this record. Uh I'll let you kick this one off, Joe. What was your, uh, your first reaction? Well, this was suggested by our little bu- our buddy. I call him little buddy, but our little buddy AUR in Pakistan. Got it right this time. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> as soon as we both we were listening to this together, as soon as I pressed play. Right away, I got, you know, I got the whole dubstep vibe. And right away, I was like, eh, I don't know, man. You know, like the dubstep. It's a bit much sometimes. Uh, for me personally, dubstep, I wasn't, I don't hate it. But like, I find that when I listen to anything that's dubstepy or too much like that, after about 10 minutes, I got to listen to something else because it's ear fatiguing and it just, uh, it's too, too tiring to listen to. Uh, but I do appreciate the amount of editing that goes into it, the creative editing that goes into it to make some of these things yeah. really work nicely. Uh, the sonic exploration at one point there was like some glitchy vocals when i always like that kind of stuff so i think more vocals would be cooler uh you know to give a break to all the craziness it's like it's the same thing for like death metal or any extreme kind of metal for me where it's like if it's too much always fast blast beats and uh, singing and screaming you get tired so you need that yeah. break those dynamic pauses in there I got my piece out. <laughs> there you go. You got a lot of feedback in there. No, I, I definitely think uh, there was, listen, there was moments on this uh, compilation for sure. In terms of the dubstep sound for me, I think it's a sound that's a little bit out of my realm. Um, but again, like Joe's saying that the creativity to be able to put something like this together, the editing, also the visualizer that they had going so well with the music. I think mm-hmm. it was all really, really cool. And uh Definitely, you know, probably not going to be on my playlist, but in terms of like EDM events and stuff, Joe, I'm a fan of that. And I think it's a, it's a cool community. So shout out to them. Huge community, man. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. So next up we have um, suggested by GameX Simmons. We took one of his three suggestions. We took Islands, A Passionate Age. What'd you think now this that? had a bunch of different sounds in it. That, that was the one thing that I noticed. And, you know, at first I liked it more so like i like the experimentation but i almost started to feel joe like this almost had too much going on for me i don't know if you you felt the same 
Well, actually, I kind of felt a bit, I don't know, about too much going on. It seemed sparse at first. Right away, I was thinking Pink Floyd with some of the sounds yeah. and, uh, and the imaging. Um, but and then it's like I was th- really, you know, okay, I get it. Now I got the vibe. And then this disco-esque kind of section comes out of nowhere, and which is sometimes a breath of fresh air and sometimes it's like, mm, I'm not sure. So, like, it was interesting for sure. Even with the vocoded vocals on, on top of it was cool. But mm, it was decent, I would say, you know. Yeah, definitely decent. It wasn't my favorite, but I didn't hate it either. And, and you know, like no. I think that that's there's such a spectrum for music that you know you're you're not always going to fall on the end of loving it or or even you know strongly opposing it. You might fall somewhere in the middle, and that's kind of where I felt for this one. So I could see how other people could get more into this, but again, maybe not on my actual playlist. Yeah. Uh, up next, death from above. Uh, death from above. Heads up. Suggested by not Donald Fagan. Obviously, we're familiar with Death from Above. Um, that was really cool. I I wasn't familiar with that. They have been around this long. Like 20 this, years ago, this album came out. Yeah, this EP or album, whatever, came out 20 years ago. So I was like totally shocked when I saw the release date. Um, but it's instantly them, recognizably them, except just a lot more punky. This one like was punk from A to Z. Like it was very, yeah. you know, monotonous, but not in a negative way, but just there here's what you got that underground punk you know yeah and i remember like as i was listening to it i i I said let me cue up a more recent album 2014 and just to see like how have they evolved you know and or have they evolved Uh, obviously i knew they did and i listened to it it still sounds like them right we listened to it it still sounds like them just like you said more polished yeah evolved but also slowed down a bit you know, just yeah. more groovy a bit, you know, and like the production is still like raw, dirty, fuzzy tones, but just a, maybe a bit better or a bit more less punk, you know, than the, than than uh, the CP. They've definitely become more refined for sure. And the band, I've, I think I've got to see them live too, maybe even three times now. So definitely oh. a solid band. And they're a duo, right? Live? Yeah, two of them. So many of these bands now, right? Like we even have guests coming up in a week or so uh, that stand stills. There's a husband and wife yeah. team, and a duo, powerhouse duo. It's weird because I find, like, I find like you had the trios, which we had uh, on the channel uh, last week. Uh, motorcycle display team. You have Rush, who's like our you know our yeah. best Canadian export in terms of trios and stuff. And you and what's unique about the trio is you have more room to move. There's less instruments, but yet you want to fill up a bit more, right? Mm-hmm. And and yeah, then I, I find that. that all these duo bands that came out, but they sound huge. They sound big. Yeah. Not, it doesn't sound like anything is missing. That's what I, that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, I have know? no clue how they do it too. Right. Like maybe it might be different layerings and stuff, but yeah, I mean, yeah, for, for, sure. for a band like, like this, they, especially no guitarist. I mean, it's insane. Well, but this is because you could see like what he does is like, you know, add some distortion on the bass, So it fills up that whole spectrum. But like, uh, what's really, I find challenging is not becoming too samey all the time. You know, you're limited in yeah. your information, but you're not, right? Because you can do whatever you want. You can stretch out. That's a, that, That's where I find the challenges. Well, that's the thing, too. It's about, you know, trying to stay fresh while also staying with that format. So definitely a, a solid group for doing that. Yeah. So next and the final suggestion up by our friend here, uh, which happens to be the winner for me again. I mean, this guy yes. just has, the, <laughs> he has us down pat. Like, he knows. He does. I'm going to put this, they're going to love it, you know, like, or, or, <laughs> or I'm going to freak them out. And this definitely exactly. freaked us out. We were laughing the whole time because this video, I don't know if it's Elvis or Elvis, Il- Wildvis, Mr. Toot. Anyways, that's Mr. all you need to Toot. do. Search Mr. Toot. And you may be disappointed, but I doubt you will be because it's just fun. Uh, first note I put here is really quirky. I enjoy yeah. the instrumentation because it's not your typical instrumentation. That's for sure. Uh, but I couldn't take the singer seriously. Like, I mean, he just looked <laughs> so out of context as he was singing. Uh, and I even put laugh out loud here, but like, you know, and, and, and the, the part that had me literally laughing out loud was in the middle of the song. And like, it's a climactic spot, which was perfect for the video. They break into the, he breaks into this like jazz fusion. Key yeah. Tank. So, yeah. <laughs> He's dressed like getting Lee from the eighties and subdivisions. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> this is definitely my pick for the week. This is like, I'm going to watch this or listen to this again. It's just, you can't, I can't help it. What I wrote down was it's so bad, it's good. And and I, yeah. I sort of mean that as a compliment. Uh, you know, obviously a song that's supposed to be lighthearted and fun and, and not heavy handed. But at the same time, like like you're saying, Joe, solid instrumentation, solid groove. Um, yeah. I liked it, you know, so I, I definitely, 
this might have been one of my favorites too, I would have to say. Yeah, they're like 17 million views on this video on top of it, you know? So yeah, it's definitely worth a watch and a listen for sure for your years. <laughs> Make sure to go check out the Sound Mojo Comms tab on our YouTube page. And you never know, we might be giving you a shout out and reacting to your suggestion on the next episode of the show. So now we're going to hop into our conversation with the guys from Butcher Brown. We want to thank everybody from the group for taking the time to join us on episode number 96 of Inner Sleeve. And we'll be right back to catch you guys afterwards. You never ever ever gonna stop rocking hip hop, mix it with jazz, soul, and rock, and some other shit. Songs I heard was sleeping on the train, speaking through the country, your friends in the rain. Finna cop a new trumpet with a gold chain. Got that beat, knock the vibration, whole frame. They finna see me shining and they gonna know the name. Tennis shoes, triple trade, this shit is insane. This is from the brain. All right, cool. So we got some video going. We got the guys from Butcher Brown here joining us. Uh, we appreciate you gents for taking the time today. Yeah, 100%. So oh, yeah. we got some. Happy some, to be here. Thank you for joining us. So we got someone calling in from Maryland. We got we got some people in different locations. Virginia today. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Nice. Spread out all over the place. So, so what's been going on right now? Uh, anticipating uh, maybe some tour dates. Tell us about what's been on the roster. Well, we just dropped um, the record. <laughs> yes, sir. Last, last Friday, um, Triple Trey uh, featuring the Redazzo Big Band. Um, finally out. Happy for it to be out. We recorded it like three and a half years ago. So, you know, I'm just like thrilled that people are finally getting to put their ears on it. Um, and yeah, we getting ready for um, Montreal. Um, I'm sorry, Monterey <laughs> Jazz Fest. <laughs> Monterey Jazz Fest. Yeah. Monterey Jazz Fest. Um, we play there on Saturday. Um, and on like actually tomorrow we fly into San Francisco to do an in-store performance at Amoeba in Berkeley, California. Oh, oh nice. The legendary right. Amoeba or, or one of them. Yeah. The okay. legendary the legendary Amoeba doing a what's in my bag um yeah. interview as well. So it's gonna be dope to pick out some records. Yeah, for real. Very cool. I mean, you guys, it seems like you guys do a lot of different sort of promotional things. I mean, is there a lot of time spent on uh, sort of deciding which media you're going to do and maybe which segments and appearances? Uh, really, well, at least not on our end. I mean, they they kind of, we got people that are that are organizing things for us in different areas. Um, but at this point, when we're putting out music, we try to talk to as many people as possible and really try to get the picture of what we do out there. Yeah. Hundred percent. You know, with, with you guys is different genre because it's it's definitely obviously a fusion. Your music of many different types. Is it a big sort of demographic of different people reaching out to you, like different types of radio stations or different types of shows? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a reflection of what we're doing. I mean, we played Afro Punk a couple of weeks ago, and then we turn around and play Pittsburgh Jazz Fest, and then now we're playing. Monterey Jazz Fest, which is like a legendary jazz festival. And then, um, yeah, it was kind of all over the place. Um, in my mind, it's like we're kind of reaching different people with the music. Um, I mean, we always, I mean, we have an album called All Purpose Music. And I think it is actually a reflection of like the band in general, just like how we operate and like the type of music that we listen to just on a daily basis and like how we implement that into our, um, you know, our music scene, you know. 100%. I mean, how would each one of you guys maybe on this call describe your music? Because you guys obviously do a lot of jazz festivals. Would you say Butcher Brown is more of a jazz group or, or is there even a, a specific label that you can give the group? <laughs> yeah, we have a label. Challenge, challenge accepted. <laughs> cool music for everybody under the sun. Yeah. That's right. There yeah. you go. That's the label. That's what I um, like to hear. Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know. I think we've just always kind of been like, let's just make the music we want to make and let's just make what we're vibing to. And if it gets classified as whatever, cool. Like, but it's never, like our thought process of making music is not ever really like, oh, we want to, you know, like let's shoot for this or whatever. Like, it's just kind of like, it's literally whatever we're feeling at, at the time or, you know, at that point in our career. So it's like, I mean, genres are cool, but we're just kind of like just here for the vibes, I guess. Oh. What is the genre bending? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does the writing process look for for you guys? I'm assuming you're all like, I don't know, just the way I'm pictured in my head. You're all together in a room. You're all jamming. You're playing. Like, how does the songwriting go from there? Or do you guys bring in separate elements that you've done, worked on at home kind of thing? Sometimes. Sometimes it moves like that. Yeah. It's kind of... It's kind of just like the music with the writing process. Sometimes cats come in with stuff. Sometimes we just make something up in sound check. Sometimes everything is based off of one instrument, one way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things are written out for a big band. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> things are written out for the symphony. You know what I mean? It's nice. Everything about Butcher Brown kind of just depends on how we feel at the moment. Yeah, so the music dictates. Which is what me. makes it so nice is that it's, it's truly a real-time organization. Oh, that's cool. Did you feel like it was always that way? Did you guys always have that sort of just we're going to roll with the punches and see what happens? Or did it take time to to sort of get used to that part? I would say I it's so. kind of always I think it's kind of always been that way. I mean, you know, me or I'd say like DJ, Corey, Marcus and myself all kind of came up together. Morgan's a little bit younger, but like we all came up together. So we were all learning how to make our way and make music together so when we get together it's really natural and we're all coming from the same place we're all on the same page you know no doubt how, how did you guys actually get together uh in the beginning I'm, I'm curious how this actually got formed richmond um i mean i would say also like really a big part of it was virginia commonwealth university we call it vcu um you know they have a they've always had a good music program there um, and, you know, I think being that it's in Richmond, which is like the capital of Virginia, right kind of in the middle, you know, that's where everybody that's from Virginia would go, you know, a lot of creatives. And so like, um, you know, you meet, you find your people, man. I think you just find people that are like-minded. Um, we all sort of, gra you know, gravitated towards one another, um, you know, playing in different musical situations. Like I've known a few of the cats in the band since I was 15. I'm 30, I'm wow. almost 32 now. So like, you know, we go way back. Um, Morgan has an older sister who went to school with Andy and DJ and I believe with Tennis Shoe as well. So like she was a She's a classical violinist. So it was all intertwined. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it just kind of like, you know, you find your folks, man, and you gel. Um, and eventually, like, you know, it just gets to a point where it's just, you know, it's just natural that you're going to probably make music together at some point, mm -hmm. whether it's on a, you know, just a small level for fun or, you know, it turns into something serious, which we're on right now. When you first started this, where would you guys rehearse exactly uh, to get all together? Because obviously a lot of members in the band, what was the strategy there? It might be a good one for Devon to answer because it's always <laughs> kind of been his house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess my house has always been the, the spot. Oh, here we go. Basically, like, I mean, you know, I bought a bunch of gear kind of growing up and that was in my mom's house for a while. And then at, at Williams School, me, Andy, and... uh. A, a previous band member keep asking we all moved into a house together and this kind of was like the nucleus and like the beginnings of what became Jellystone and what became the Butcher Brown sound in a sense. Very cool. How, how about the name Butcher Brown? Where exactly does that that name come from exactly? <laughs> Devon, do you want to do the honors? <laughs> <laughs> Or you need to do the honors there. I'll you need to show him. You need to show okay. him. You got to show him. You got to show him. Right, come on, bro. On that left side, side bro. On that, I'll on send you. On that I'll show you. I'll, I'll show him what it is. I'll, I'll send you a photo later. But um, I'll send the photo. Let's see it right now. Come on, man. Lift that leg. Oh, <laughs> if I was, on, I'm on my laptop. But yo, so Butcher Brown uh, came from a video game <laughs> called Ready to Rumble Boxing, and um, okay, round one. It was on PlayStation and Sega Dreamcast. I used to play the game a lot as a kid. Um, but one day, um, both DJ and I were like playing PS1 or something just at the house. Like, I don't know why. We were just chilling. And 
we started playing the game and there's a character on there. He's kind of funny looking and reminds of it resembles someone that we know back in Richmond. Um, OK. And he made a DJ made a reference and was like, hey, you see Chuck on the screen. And then we were like, <laughs> ha, 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 ha. And so um, his name isn't Chuck, but that's what we're going to yeah. go with. So exactly. shout out Chuck. So, any <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that was kind of what started that whole Butcher Brown thing. And I don't know, we were probably just smoking some weed. It was like, hey, we're going to call the band Butcher Brown. Ha, 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 ha. And it stuck. So <laughs> here we are like 10 or 11 years later and yep. Butcher Brown. There you go. Do you guys get that a lot where people think someone in the band is called Butcher? Like, like by the way, which one's pink? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, man. I guess that you can weed out the real ones through that uh, scenario. I would imagine. Yeah, no, it's 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 funny. It's all like um, it's it's it can be more than it should. It could be all of us, you know. Sometimes we just might be like, "Yeah, I'm butchered today. Who's gonna be butchered today?" Um, <laughs> That's but cool. you know, we have fun with it, man. It's cool. Awesome. I was curious, like, what came first? Like, was it jazz, hip hop, rap, like R and B? What like sort of. You know, each one of you, what did you guys get into first or what was the first predominant love in music? Um, I mean, well, you mean individually? Sure. Or collectively. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think we definitely all have different backgrounds and it kind of comes out that way, like in the music. Like I, I started playing violin first and then uh, then I got into the jazz thing. Uh, and now as I was in college, I got more away from the jazz thing. I played in church for a long time, so it's kind of you know, I think all that stuff comes out. Um, I, I think we're all different in it too. So uh, that's for me personally. How about the other guys? Was it more jazz based or was it more uh, maybe rooted in, in other genres? I mean, you know, me as a kid, I was in all sorts of music, you know, like uh, that's when, that's when MTV was a big thing. So I was like watching the music videos. I was watching TRL and stuff. And that's what I was into. I was into like classic rock, but I was also into, you know, a little bit of rap and hip hop, kind of just what was filtering to me through radio and television. Um, but yeah, you know, I went to jazz school, you know, so you can say I really, I, I studied the jazz and that was the first sort of music that I dived deep into learning how to play. But, you know, I remember when Get Rich or Die Trying came out and I was like, what is this? <laughs> like, yeah. this shit is killing. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest album in the world at the time, right? I mean, it was, it was hugely famous and, and, you know, 50 Cent was everywhere. But, you know, the same could be said the first time I heard Dark Side of the Moon, which predates my birth. And I was like, well, what is this here? I could get into this. So, you know, it's always just been for me, like, pretty eclectic, but good music. Good music I like. Bad music, not so much. <laughs> which is good, right? Yeah, Again, breaking, breaking down the genres. Sorry, go ahead, Corey. Oh, no, I was just going to say I could say the same. I mean, much like um, Andy, um, you know, I have, I'm thankful, like, my parents, you know, they're the generation, they're 60s babies. So, like, you know, they kind of grew up on everything. You know, you heard whatever was yeah. on the radio is what you listen to. So, like, you know, they had an appreciation for classic rock, soul music, R&B, um, kind of everything under that, like, umbrella. So, like, just any, um, any of those genres, you know, I heard in the house. But, you know, my dad was really into, like, acid jazz and a lot of fusion, um, funk, um, yeah, like, you know, a lot of the stuff that was coming out in the 90s. Um, my mom was into Sade, TLC. So, like, as a kid, I was hearing a lot of music. Um, and then, of course, you know, discovering my own stuff. And MTV played a huge role in BET, VH1, VH1 Soul. Um, yeah, you know, and the radio. So, like, you know, I never, I, I, was, I was open. I didn't discriminate when it came to music at all. I still don't. I appreciate everything. Listening to the music, a song like Liquid Light, which, you know, just dropped in the summer, uh, you know, you can hear all these different types of fusions and these different types of, uh, you know, sounds. So how, how did you approach maybe a song like that and, and the video as well? I mean, Liquid Light, just like all the other tracks on our new album, started with Marcus, started with Tennis Shoe, Triple Tray, which came out in 20, was it 2018 or 2019, Marcus? 19. 
2019. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Speak on that. Time speak on did that. that big band set. Yeah, can you speak okay. to the original Triple Tray a little bit? The original was just a hip hop album that I wanted to put together. Um, just, just I just wanted to do it, and I didn't really had the resources to do it the same way that a lot of the other albums did it. So I just kind of did it the way I could do it, and that's how it ended up coming about. So a lot of the sounds, is like Liquid Light, especially. Um, like, you know, that's that's a that's just vibes I could find in the computer, you know, and just put it together in a way that sounds good to me. Um, a lot of the songs came about exactly that way. The They started from a musical place and then the, the rap lyrics are kind of like icing on the cake a little bit. Okay. So uh, like that's the general direction for that. Um, but I think that kind of stops when we meet the big band. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I heard I heard the album when Marcus released it. And at this time, I had been doing my big band project for almost two years. And I had started collaborating with musicians and writing shows and writing sets of music to kind of feature some of my favorite musicians that were my friends. And it just kind of made sense. You know, I wanted to do one with Marcus. So uh, I said, man, let's just take this album you just did and let's just do a show. And it was kind of like the album release show in a way, although it came yeah. out like well after the album came out. Um, but it just made sense for me at the time. Cause that's what I was on. I was just on, let's make, let's collaborate. Let's feature these musicians that are friends of mine with this type of music that I love to write for the big band. So um, I basically took Marcus's original album and just sort of recreated, reimagined it for a large ensemble. Um, and some of the tunes are very like faithful to the original, and some of them are a complete departure and everywhere in between. So, so that's what you hear now. You hear the product of like, okay, so Tennis Shoe album comes out. randazzo has been doing the big band for a time. We're going to make a show happen. We're on the road. We're touring. So basically, I'm just like on my laptop <laughs> while we're out on the road making horn charts and arranging these tunes did the show our good friend lance kohler from minimum wage recording was in the audience and really expressed that he loved that music so much that he wanted to record it at his studio go in the studio lay it down and that's what you hear now sweet wow shout out to lance kohler minimum wage recording yeah we've been recording with lance at minimum wage I mean, I've been going over there since I moved to Richmond in 2008. He was the first studio that I went to. And I'm sure the other Richmond cats that predate me here in Richmond were up in there even before I knew what it was. So yeah, wow. Lance, Lance has been a huge part of the Richmond scene. And his studio has been one that has just existed for, I mean, geez, probably coming up on years, almost right? 20 years now, right? Shit. Lance, I think, moved to RVA like 03, 02 from New Orleans. Yeah. So That's coming crazy. up on 20 years. Like I've been going in there for like since 05. Mm -hmm. So a local legend so, for sure. Yeah, Definitely. Lance's oh. studio is, is clutch. And it, it's also, it's important to kind of talk about Lance too, because he got, he recorded some music that we have coming up that isn't out yet. So Lance is kind of baked into the sound himself. You know what I mean? Start a jacket, gold chains and some new gems. Cadillac pass on the spare, had a suitcase. Shorty on a passenger, had a two day for a black man. Black man, black man, black man, black man. Do you know where you're going? Where you're going? Black man, black man, black man, black man. Do you know where you're heading to? Speaking of studios, like I know you guys obviously are a, a performance band and you perform live, you perform together all the time. And I'm assuming recording live as well. A lot of your tracks are live off the floor. I'm wondering, like, which one, which one do you prefer, live or studio? <laughs> studio. I think it's studio, man. Yeah. I mean, studio. we'll play shows forever. Uh, I think everybody just like I think the band is. I mean, well, Butcher Brown started, uh, even though I wasn't even in it, but it just kind of started off as like kind of a production thing. Where it's just like, let's just get these tracks. And um, and then the shows happened and people like loved them. Um, and then it kind of morphed into that. But it's always been like, I think everybody's kind of viewed themselves as as producers. Like, I mean, I know nowadays I'm just kind of like, I'm a guitar player, but I think all of us describe ourselves more so as it's like, we're producers, like it's a band of producers. Like, and we, specialize in certain things and certain certain instruments but it's like we're just 
you know, we're producers. We like making records and making songs. Uh, and we can play shows too. So we'll always. We'll Are you guys hands up. on? Are you hands on in the studio, like mixing, miking, uh, doing those type of things? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So so we have been. For levels. Yeah, we have been. Lately, I feel like with the last, look, these days with the recording session, we like to have someone else engineer yeah. so that we can just get in our creative space. But all purpose music, you know, Virginia Noir, Grown Folk, all that stuff that we did early on was. It was DJ. It was Devon doing doing all the all the engineering and and us just kind of like chipping in where we can, just like yo, where where where's this mic go? Where's this cable go? Let's get this shit plugged in. We can't afford an engineer yeah. right now, but these days it's great to just go in the studio and just get in a creative space and let someone else handle all the all the like technical aspects of it. But we still like have our hand in like you know the process we don't you know it's like we have we're definitely. lucky to have trust but you know we're definitely like hey yo turn that snare up or can you put this right. uh filter on the snare on whatever instrument it is like we want this to oh no we tell them what to do yeah <laughs> there you we go. Just doing, we're just not doing we're not you just don't we're do not, it we're not, we're not touching them knobs anymore for real for real now we're just we'll do like, it at home yeah, you know, I feel yeah like that's true. okay everybody in their own situation in that's their true. own session will dive in there and turn some knobs just because we all, we all kind of know how that works from being around, you know, engineers and studios that's doing actual business. But like, we definitely like to feed into the economy of that stuff too. Because, mm. you know, we, un, we know music is an ecosystem. And like, you know, without bands, you can't do interviews. Without interviews, bands don't have no interviews to push their records. So it's like, both are equally as important. It's a little bit of a seesaw. Yeah. And so like same thing with engineers. We know mad engineers. We just we just started doing regular business with Zach Victor, who's mm -hmm. an amazing engineer. And he's been taking care of our front of house. And so to see somebody that is as good at their job as we are at ours feels good to be around because we learning from him just as much as he's learning from us and we're working together on top of that. Mm -hmm. So it's all that, you know what I mean? We like to we just kind of see what's appropriate, similar to with the music composing and playing we just kind of see how we feel in the moment and what works then and there i'm curious also like what how do you guys spice uh, spice i know you do different like you take advantage of the live situation to spice things up like uh, how do you guys approach that like what, what could you give us an example of what would be different from the record and live oh <laughs> so much. So oh, man. Man. <laughs> those rehearsed before the shows uh, <laughs> we just started rehearsing before the shows and we've wow. only done like three rehearsals. <laughs> I think that's the Pretty thing awesome. that makes it insane is because everybody learns the music and everybody's sharp doing other stuff. So awesome. we come together and just have a conversation. Interesting. Like you don't yeah. practice yeah. conversation skills. You yeah. just talk to a bunch of people and it'll get better on its own. And that's the same thing we do with the music. Is we just play with a bunch of people and do a bunch of projects and then come together and do this. I think we rehearse all the time in our own way. <laughs> Yeah. We bring yeah. ideas to the table from just other inspiration, like just listening to different music. We might have played a song in the studio that we recorded on a record, and it sounds completely different than the way we play it now just because of whatever sources that we've been checking out for music. Just like, oh, man, you know, I'm going to try this over this over this track. Let me see what this going to sound like. My bad, Morgan. Go ahead, bro. Awesome. No, nah, you good. I, I was just going to say that the show's been evolving a lot, even in the past few months. Partially because of the rehearsals, I think with King Butch, like the previous uh, full length album, like that was the first time where we got in the studio and we didn't really necessarily worry about recreating everything live. It was more like, all right, let's make an album experience and then we'll, you know, we'll get the we'll get the record. I mean, we'll get the live experience to be something different or we'll do what we can or we'll change it up to match the, the five of us being on stage. And I think previously it wasn't really that it was kind of like let's let's make sure we um you know we don't want to do anything that we can't recreate live but now it's just kind of like paying respect to the fact that both of those are two separate experiences like albums are mm -hmm. different live shows are different like and they totally should be different so um yeah so i think we we started to tap into that the rehearsals and everything definitely have been helping and it's just kind of yeah let's go that's awesome. So what are you guys looking forward to most uh, with this album cycle? Obviously, uh, Triple Tray is out everywhere. What, what are you guys uh, looking, to, looking to push next? Obviously, you have your festivals coming up. The LP 
two is what we're we're working on this next record right now, right? <laughs> Damn, we're always working on some music, man. <laughs> always working. I love it. Yeah, we're yeah, working on the new album. We got some singles coming out. We got some collaborations coming out. We got some videos coming out. Um, we're working on a lot of cool performances with a lot of other amazing artists, whether that be, uh, you know, doing like a live stream studio type situation or go to a said place and open up for said organization. We kind of, we, we're going to be all over that, all over the, uh, all over the map. It's these go. next 12 months. Awesome. Awesome. I would like to add that personally, I'm looking forward to bringing this album, Triple Tray, to the masses in its true form and finding a way to do big band shows around the world because that's a tall order and we are determined to, to bring this to the people. You know, we, we did a show, like an album release show last Friday in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the energy in the room was just so amazing. And that's why I love putting on these shows in the first place to kind of, so to kind of mix it in with the Butcher Brown universe is really special and exciting for me. That's awesome. It's, it's also going to be fun exciting. to prove some people wrong too. <laughs> There's a few people that are like, I can't do this. Some people said we. Some people said it couldn't be done. We're going to do it. That's right. We'll see. We'll see. Gonna prove them wrong. Exactly. We we got the evidence right here. Well, awesome guys. Listen, keep kicking ass, and thank you so much for taking the time. We we really appreciate it. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Inner sleep. Thank, thank you for having us. Appreciate, well, you. appreciate you, man. We'll be in awesome, Canada. Guys. Looking soon. forward to meeting. Yeah, yeah, hoping you guys come out here soon. Definitely, we'll be watching for sure for your tour dates. Even if it's in the winter, I'll actually leave my house and I'll come and see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, All man. right, guys. Hit us up, man. All right, man. Well, okay, thanks guys. so much. Thank Take you. care. Stay tall, man. You never ever ever gonna stop rocking hip hop. Mix it with jazz, soul, and rock and some other shit. Songs I heard was sleeping on the train, speaking through the country, your friends in the rain. Been the cop a new trumpet, whipping gold chain. Got that beat, not the vibration, whole frame. They finish in the we want to give a huge shout out to the guys from Butcher Brown for taking the time to join us on this brand new episode of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. You know, watching that back, Joe, I got to say, I really like the fact that these, these guys are so open to so many different things. You know, you talk to them about genres. They don't really care. They don't really want to hear it. All they want to hear about is making the next good music with the next big turn in their sound. And it seems like they see, seem to do that seamlessly from project to project. Yeah, and they've been together. Uh, most of them have been together like 15 years or something, you know, yeah. like, uh, playing together. Very um, prolific in terms of like creating music with other artists amongst themselves, their own stuff at home. Um, yeah, definitely great musicians too. I mean, like you can watch the videos, you'll see they're just like, they're, they do live performances. And when I asked the question of like, you know, do you want to keep it like the studio? Because they're live band, they're performance band. So I'm pretty yeah. sure... 99.9% of the time, it's never going to be the same. Even the recording we heard is not what they did the take before or the take before that. You know what I mean? It's like, it's always something little, something new added. And and you saw they laughed. They're like, yeah, no, I want to try this. What's this going to sound like? You know, I'm going to try this on this yeah. part. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, and um, I wonder, like, I'd love to be in a space when they're sort of creating and see how it comes together, you know, or even be in the studio when they're tracking. Yeah, it'd be very cool to see. I mean, so many different, you know, musical sounds and musical backgrounds coming together in, in this melting pot of a group and definitely one that we don't suggest you guys sleep on or miss out on if you want to connect with butcher brown as a band we have the links down below in the description whether you're tuned in on video or audio currently make sure to hit subscribe on your favorite platform for sound mojo whether it's youtube apple Podcasts, or spotify make sure to leave us a rating as well a positive rating or review on any of those services also follow us on social media at Sound Mojo, we're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. Make sure to come interact with us. We'll retweet you, we'll repost you, whatever we need to do. Thanks so much for tuning into this brand new episode of the Inner Sleeve Music Podcast. We'll catch you guys next week.